If you had a near-death, shared death, or spiritually transformative experience, how much can you believe in the events that happened to you? Assuming that you tell the truth, how much can other people believe in the stories you tell? Dr. Jan Holden is going to give us the inside scoop on these questions. Welcome to the Afterlife Files, where we investigate near-death, shared death experiences, and how they affect you. Unlike podcasts that are just stories, we will give you the heads up on what to look for in our conversation. Then, after the interview, stick around. We'll help you make sense of those accounts so you can incorporate the insights into your life. I think you'll find that once your most profound questions have been answered, living life in the physical is filled with more peace and joy. Here's your heads up. In addition to believability, Jan is going to talk about mind versus brain. Can we verify what other people perceive during their experience? Our purpose in life? How do we live with what we know? And how do we think about controversial issues? That's a really fun one. You'll soon be clear that Jan has been a professional educator her entire life. Afterwards, I summarize my notes and I needed to look up how to spell erudite. She's that clear in her explanations. Here is Jan's bio. After 31 years on the University of North Texas Counseling Program faculty, Jan Holden retired in 2019 as Professor Emerita of Counseling. Beginning in 1988 with her doctoral dissertation, her primary research focus has been counseling implication of near-death and related experiences. In this research area, she has over 50 referee journal publications, several chapter and book publications, including lead editorship, editorship on the 2009 Handbook of Near-Death Experience. That would be this guy right here. It's a great book. And over 100 national and international presentations. Among Jan's numerous recognitions is the 2019 UNT Eminent Faculty Award, one of the university's highest honors. Since 2008, she has served as an editor-in-chief of the International Association for Near-Death Studies Scholarly Journal, and Jan, you get extra stars in heaven for doing that. Dr. Holden serves currently as IAN's president. Her website is janholden.com. Here's our interview. Hey there, Jan. Wow, it is great to have you today. Hey, Scott. I'm so happy to see you. This is going to be a fun hour, so let's get right at it. Um, how did you get interested in near-death experiences way back at the beginning? Oh, my goodness. You really want to hear the whole story. Well, I uh, when I was growing up, I was always interested in things that couldn't be easily explained, like ESP and things like that. So I read books about that and about uh, like Edgar Cayce, uh, the sleeping prophet who would diagnose people's medical conditions that he'd never even met and and, you know, things like that. And then when I was in college, I was home one summer and my father had been reading a book called The Great Soul Trial. And it's a nonfiction book about uh, a miner in Arizona who disappeared. And when the state opened his safe deposit box, presuming him dead, they found several hundred thousand dollars. Now, this is around 1960 when several hundred thousand dollars was more than it is today. And a handwritten note saying that he wanted the money used for research on the survival of the human soul after death. So the state of Arizona put a little ad in the paper and which they had to do and they thought nobody would see it and the whole thing would just disappear and they would get to keep the money for the state coffers. But to their surprise, 
over 100 entities and organizations came forward to claim the money from this will. And so the book is mostly trans... The, oh, so um, the, the state of Arizona actually had to put on a trial where they heard all these people come and testify how they would use the money. And then a judge would decide who got the money. So there's a little ironic follow-up to this that I'll tell you about. Not everybody would appreciate this, but I'm sure you will. So I can't wait. This is great. <clears throat> so the book is mostly the, the uh, uh, transcripts of the trial and uh, included were the research director of the American Society for Psychical Research, the, the research director of the Psychical Research Foundation, testifying how they would use this money to do research on the survival of the human soul after death. So it was just fascinating to me. And um, so here's the ironic twist. The uh, judge, oh, the, the ASPR and the PRF that I just mentioned, and the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix were the three big contenders for the money. And the judge, in his wisdom, gave the money to the Barrow Neurological Institute that said that they were going to do research on the survival of the human soul after death by dissecting brain, like somehow that was going to make sense. But, but because they were the most, like, acceptable organization, I think that sure, that, sure. you know, played into. Anyway, the ASPR and the PRF got together, filed a, um, what do you call that? Uh, um, An appeal? Thank you. The, yeah, so the ASPR and the PRF got together, filed an appeal, and won it. And the money was actually used in what still today is some of the best research on out-of-body experiences, where they um, used an, a, somebody who was adept at having out-of-body experiences and going, you know, doing astral projection to another room and reading a coded kind of thing and, yeah, and that yeah. sort of stuff. So here's the ironic twist. Um, fast forward now, probably 30 years, and uh, comes Pam Reynolds, who we'll oh. probably be talking about more later today. Um, and she, for a long time, was the poster child for veridical perception, which is the um, that where the near-death experiencer based on the position and condition of their physical body, um, they shouldn't know certain things. They shouldn't be able to perceive things or know things that they do and, uh, and are later shown to be accurate. And in her case, uh, they were doing this um, surgery on her brain to uh, remove an aneurysm that uh, they had to um, first uh, of course, totally anesthetize her, then lower her body temperature to about 60 degrees, which her, that her heart then stopped. And they had her on a, a machine that uh, took her blood out and, and kept it viable while they, and they drained the blood out of her brain so they could go in and do this aneurysm, uh, fix this aneurysm. And when they did the repair, they closed her up, laid her back down, uh, warmed her up, started her heart, and um, she was back. Well, she reported that uh, during the, uh, just as they were about to, after they had done the incision into the back of her head, and they inserted, they were, or I'm sorry, they were about to do the incision in the back of her head, and um, they use what's called a bone saw, and that the sound of that saw. It, she's a mus She was a musician, and and it was a, like a, this high D. And it. She said suddenly she was conscious, and she was like over the surgeon's left shoulder, watching him um, as he was uh, cutting into the bone of her skull. And meanwhile, there was a woman down at toward the foot end of her body. And the woman was saying, um, 
the vein is too small. And her surgeon up at the head said, try the other side. And so, um, in fact, in order to, and, and she, and Pam said, she thought to herself, what's that woman doing down like in my, like pelvic area when this is supposed to be brain surgery? Well, she didn't realize that they use the um, femoral artery in the groin to attach to the blood um, machine. And so she was trying to get the hook up and, and the vein was too small. So she went to the other side, succeeded. And that's how they got the, you know, circuit kept her blood um, viable. So later when she regained consciousness, she reported this and it turned out that, you know, they keep really careful records and indeed that is exactly what had happened. And, but the question is, how can somebody who was totally anesthetized, chilled down to 60 degrees, now her heart hadn't stopped at this point yet, um, but they um, were draining the blood from her head and, and cutting into her skull. And she, her eyes, of course, were taped shut as they always are when we're fully anesthetized because our eyes would dry out. And, but in her case, her ears were stuffed with these um, uh, little speakers that um, fed this loud banging noise into one ear and loud white noise in the other ear. And they switched off because the loud banging noise, if it, it just stayed in one ear, it would create cause deafness. So they switch back and forth, but she's constantly got this sound bombarded in her ears and that's because they're monitoring her EEG, her brain waves, to make sure, because the last thing to go is hearing. So when they get this thing blasting in her ears and her, her EEG goes flat, it's like she's not, her brain isn't functioning anymore. It's not processing even this loud sound. And it was, these speakers were stuffed in her ears. They filled her ears and then they put, gauze and tape over them so she couldn't hear anything normally and um, yet she recounted this conversation that was verified by um, operation records and she also said that she saw when she saw what he was holding that the um, she said she had heard the term bone saw but this didn't look like anything she had thought was a bone saw. She said it looked like an electric toothbrush. And um, the, the person who researched this case originally, Michael Sabom, a cardiologist, had to send off to Fort Worth, Texas to get a, a picture of this thing. And, um, and, it, uh, and it turns out that it looks exactly like an electric toothbrush. It's more like a drill than a, a, you know, we think of a saw as, uh, 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 yep. you know. So anyway, she became like the poster child for veridical perception. And the, the here's the ironic part, where this um, uh, pioneering surgical procedure at the time, it was very pioneering, um, was done, was the Barrow Neurological Institute in <laughs> Phoenix, Arizona. The very place that had originally been, you know, given the kids will, then it was taken from them. And then they ended up being the site that um, provided at the time the best evidence for the survival of the human soul after death. It's just like the universe has got to be laughing at this. Yeah. <laughs> so. And so that was a, a case that really piqued your attention. It did. And so, um, so I uh, was working, so I read then, then to fast forward that, um, that book, The Great Soul Trial, that was around 1970. And then in 1978, uh, I read Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life, about near-death experiences. And of course, that captured my attention. And then in uh, about 1985, I was starting work on my doctoral dissertation at 
uh, Northern Illinois University in counselor education. And um, to make a long story short, the idea that actually went through to the end was on, uh, on something related to near-death experiences. And as you probably well know, a lot of people, when they do their doctoral dissertation, you have to do it so intently and, oh, you have to defend everything you do. And by the end, a lot of people are just sick of the topic and they never want to touch it again. I was just the opposite. I was enthralled. And so it really um, created, I guess, the foundation for my 30 plus years of research on NDEs and then expanded into related topics, especially after death communication. So I've, I've really researched both of those things. But, but the, my absolute favorite topic is veridical perception for, for reasons I'm sure we'll get into. Well, you married your interest in um, NDEs with uh, counseling. Yeah. And and so clearly you were seeing uh, people being affected by um, spiritually transformative experiences. That's right. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, NDEs interface with counseling at a lot of different levels. There's the level of clinicians actually working with people who've had NDEs. And I did a study, we, we'd been hearing horror stories about people who had had horrible disclosure experiences where they tell about their near-death experience and their counselor doesn't recognize that what they're talking about. They, um, they dismiss the importance of it. They um, diagnose the person or the experience as being somehow pathological or um, even demonize the experience as somehow evil. And um, but no actual research had been done. And I did a study of near-death experiencers, experiences disclosing their NDEs to healthcare professionals and learned about what, what constituted really good experiences and, and really bad experiences. And now I use that to train counselors about how not to harm uh, near-death experiencers and other transpersonal experiencers. So there's that level. And then there's also uh, counseling is based in theory and theory is based in philosophy. And near-death experiences raise the question of materialism versus idealism. Materialism being the belief that everything is fundamentally physical. And that, so for example, our thoughts and all of that is, um, a manifestation somehow of all the electrochemical things going on in our brains versus idealism, which is the um, belief that consciousness and the brain are essentially separate, though closely related during physical existence. And that, um, that so, so consciousness precedes the physical brain and um, survives the existence of the physical brain. And, and the brain actually serves as a filter of consciousness so that we actually have much greater consciousness than we usually are aware of when we're in our physical bodies because the brain filters out the stuff that isn't necessary to get around to navigate this level of reality. You know, so, um, so there's, so there, it, as I said, on, on a lot of different levels, um, there's uh, the, an interface between NDEs and other spiritually transformative experiences and counseling. Yeah, and have you found that 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 view, the idealistic view, is that, am I saying that right? Yes. So, uh -huh. um, is now predominant in the in the world of counseling? Are we still in the material? And yeah. if only <laughs> we're definitely still in the material uh, materialism, philosophical materialism still dominates science and medicine. 
So that's one of the things that we're uh, in IANS we're addressing. And in fact, um, I'm going to be doing a special, you know, I'm editor of the Journal of Near-Death Studies, and I'm going to be doing a special issue on whether IANS should actually take a stand um, that the based on the evidence, the best um, model is idealism and that materialism is valid for the aspect of reality that it addresses, but idealism is uh, includes and um, extends beyond that and answers questions that materialism can't, Mat uh, questions like veridical perception. Well, you get an extra star in heaven for not only being president of IANS, but being the, uh, the editor. And that's quite a question to put out before the troops. It that, really is. Uh, that, you know, are we really going to say that, you know, that the case is sort of kind of closed on whether it's materialism versus idealism? Yeah. And one of the things about, um, uh, I'm going to be talking about um, uh, something called reflective judgment theory, which is the, um, it's based in extensive research. And uh, it's about how people think about controversial issues. And there are essentially three phases that people go through in their thinking. Pre reflect in the pre reflective phase, people um, don't really know that much about it, but they listen to an authority and adopt that position kind of vehemently without really knowing um, everything. And then in the next phase, they start to examine the phenomenon and they realize that there actually are several valid points of view that um, have their merits. And that the one point of view they've been holding is only one among many that are all have their merits, but they differ from each other. Now, this is this is a step beyond pre-reflective. It's you know progress, but it's not the ultimate progress because here the person is caught in a mire of relativism. It's like, well, the, this is valid and that's valid. So there just is no answer. And then in the final stage, the person actually weigh, evaluates and weighs all the evidence from these different arguments and comes to realize that some arguments are stronger than others and comes to what is what I call a current best answer. And that is and so when you say, you know, like the case is essentially closed, it's, it's like sort of, it's like as of right now, the best answer we have is idealism. And, um, and but we're open to continuing to consider new evidence and all that stuff. So it's, it's uh, there's a, a strength in the position, but it isn't the vehemence of the pre-reflective. It's more the, it's more, uh, circumspect um, and saying, well, this is as far as all the evidence is, this is the best answer we have so far. So um, IANS has taken a, um, that's the International Association for Near-Death Studies, has taken a neutral stance on like we, we we're we neutral about, you know, topics like religion and things like that. Um, and that neutrality has kind of um, pervaded everything, including taking a, a stance like this on a philosophical position. And so what I'm gonna be arguing, what, what the in the um, special issue, I'll be writing the uh, lead article where I make the case that I think it's time for IONS to do this. And then I'm gonna invite all kinds of people, like a lot of the people you've been interviewing to respond and um, and I also am going to do a survey of IANS membership to find out what their beliefs are, and um, and then um, see if it maybe results in actually IANS taking a position and um, and 
posting it on our website and saying, you know, we're, we're, um, this is where we are. Well, the, certainly the, the research backs you up in terms of the idealism and yeah. wholeheartedly. Yeah. So um, as your first, I, I'll vote right here, right now. <laughs> All right. I'll, Let's take I'll, a stand and <laughs> we're going we're gonna to call it for idealism. Yay. <laughs> so when, uh, back to you, you were talking about the, um, when people are having to disclose what happened to them, um, you, there's a, um, there, there's some perception that they had. And of course, it's really just their perception because rarely, very rarely is it a shared thing. So, you know, how, how do you deal with that from a research perspective, from a philosophical perspective? Yeah, well, in fact, you've touched on exactly why veridical perception is so near and dear to my heart, because, you know, near-death experiencers come back with messages about um, meaning and purpose in life and kind of the purpose of human existence on earth. And, um, uh, and they're, they're very um, potentially influential messages. Like, uh, as you know, the most important thing is love. And we're here to advance in our capacity to love and also to acquire knowledge. Those are the two themes that come out, but definitely love first and then learning. Um, and, uh, but if, if people are to take this message and, and, and that message has the potential to influence everything from moment to moment personal decisions to global policy decisions, you know, uh, the moment to moment personal decision is um, if somebody, you know, flips me the bird while I'm uh, driving because <laughs> I accidentally cut them off, um, how do I respond in thought and attitude? And, um, and even more so if I'm actually interacting with the person, you know, how do I respond when I'm feeling challenged in some way? And choosing the path of love rather than, you know, absence of love. Um, at the global level, um, you know, um, how do I decide whether I'm going to invade another country? You know, mm -hmm. is this the most loving thing to do? And so, um, so in order for the, this potentially very powerful message to pervade society, um, we have to get past, or not past, but beyond the idea that near-death experiences are just subjective experiences that are people's, you know, personal um, happenings. Yeah, and some sort, yeah. Yeah, exactly, anecdotes. And so that's why um, where these cases where people have, again, perceived things or come to know things that based on everything for them physically and what they should know and so forth, they, they shouldn't be able to perceive these things. They shouldn't know these things. And yet they're shown to be accurate. And for my chapter on veridical perception in the handbook of near-death experiences, which is, that's really nice. It's right over your right shoulder there. <laughs> um, I did a study where I just gleaned the published literature for uh, cases of veridical perception. And then I analyzed them in terms of how um, evidential they were. So there are some cases where a person says, you know, I saw something during my NDE and when I regained consciousness, it turned out to be accurate. It wasn't anything that I could have seen during with normal physical abilities. Well, that's interesting, but it's not really evidential. On the at the other extreme, are things 
are cases, and we call them cases rather than anecdotes, because um, in the book, The Self Does Not Die, which I would love for you to put on your bookshelf behind you, behind you yeah. Um, uh, the, um, the authors have actually um, gone back into these published cases to the, um, in most cases, it was the physician who was attending the person who had the NDE, who verified that what they perceived was accurate. So like, for example, um, this is a, from a case from The Self Does Not Die. A woman is in surgery. She um, unexpectedly flatlines, her heart stops, her breathing stops, she's um, temporarily dead. And what we know from people like Pim Van Lommel is that uh, after 20 seconds after the heart stops, uh, there's no more detectable brain activity. So, but yet this is when she said that she was um, up above, well, so um, let me let me tell the story as it actually happened. So um, she was uh, flatlined for a few minutes and then they finally got her heart going again. They finished the surgery. And of course, this whole time, she's completely anesthetized with her eyes taped shut and all that stuff, um, you know, has no physical memory of, of any of this. They take her to post-op. She regains consciousness. Her surgeon comes to check on her well-being. And she says, I know I died during the surgery. And he's like, what? <clears throat> and she says, yeah, I... Um, uh, I was up above the ceiling, looking through the ceiling, and I could see like you did this, and then this person did this, and then this guy came in with this machine, and he dropped it off, and then he left. So that was the only time that guy ever was, and she could describe him, and the physician's like, the surgeon is like, oh my gosh, you know, she, she, and he said, you're right, you're right, you're right. And he's amazed, which he shouldn't have been because if he knew anything, he would know that this is not uncommon, but this isn't the really good part of the story. Ah. She says, she says, like I said, I was above the ceiling and I was looking through and I could also see into the adjacent operating room and there they were amputating a man's leg. And when they finished, they put the amputated leg in a yellow plastic bag to dispose of it. So the surgeon says, and I saw him interviewed online and the interview is unfortunately gone now, but he said, I have no idea what's going on in the other operating rooms of the hospital. I don't pay attention. But he said, now we were, you know, a couple hours after the surgery. So he said, I left her, I went to the hospital records and found that in fact, while I was operating on her, they were amputating a man's leg in the next operating room. And he said, because that is a specialized operating room for amputation, I, I don't do amputation, I've never been in it, but it, at this time that I was looking up the, the records, it happened to be empty. So I went and I poked my head inside and there I saw the yellow plastic bags that they use to dispose of amputated body parts. Now. How would a patient who is temporarily dead know something that even her own surgeon doesn't know? And, um, and so that's, this is where it's a case where she perceived things that were not in any way part of what she expected, that were physically impossible for her to know. Sure. And then were later verified by records and a surgeon's testimony. Um, so, so these cases indicate that near-death experiences are not just subjective experiences. And in the um, in the chapter that I wrote for the handbook, um, I found that. Uh, the vast majority of these cases are completely accurate and only in a minority of cases were, were there either minor errors or there was one case that was completely erroneous. And um, out of something like um, 103 cases or something like that. And now 
um, critics might say, well, maybe when if somebody says, you know, I saw this blah, 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 and then the surgeon goes and checks and it's wrong, they're not going to publish that. But there's a statistician named Jessica Utz who has done an analysis. And for that to be the case, there would have to be a few hundred erroneous cases that had not been reported. And in all the times that I've talked about this phenomenon and so forth, and talked with even physicians and that sort of thing, you would think if the, there had been cases of erroneous perception that they would pipe up then and say, oh yeah, well, I did have such a case. Never has that happened. So the evidence, again, strongly indicates that by and large, much, very much uh, the majority, a huge majority of people's perceptions during NDEs are accurate and um, that of things that can be checked. And I, I should probably say too that um, this, these perceptions occur both in the material domain and the transmaterial domain. So the, the case that I told you about was perceiving the material domain, but sure. there are cases from the transmaterial domain where people have um, during their NDE encountered deceased loved ones, but they didn't know in physical life that the person had died. And another case from the self does not die, uh, a boy is in the hospital and he is um, close to death and um, unconscious and all that stuff. And uh, I don't think in his case he flatlined, but you don't have to. It does, you, you know, it's it's a little more evidential if if you were act, if your brain was actually not functioning. But in this case, he regained consciousness. His parents were there, you know, holding vigil overnight. He regained consciousness, and he he said, "I, you know, like went to heaven, and and I saw, you know, grandma so and so, and grandpa so and so, and and I also saw my sister." And, um, and, you know, they welcomed me, but told me that I had to go back. And so the parents are like, oh, uh-huh, you know, that's nice, sweetheart. Um, they get home after spending the whole night in the hospital. The boy's now out of danger, so they can go home and, like, take a shower and get some sleep. And they're, this was back in the days of um, answering machines. And their answering machine is full of all these messages from their daughter's uh, college where she's off um, studying, trying to get a hold of them, they call back and find out that that the previous night, um, pr just a few hours prior to when the boy regained consciousness, their daughter died in a car accident. Oh my. So she was dead at the time that he had the experience. He was more right than anything they knew in the physical world at the time. So that's what I mean when I say this, the um, perceptions can be of the material world, but they can also be in the transmaterial domain, you know, that's beyond the material world. Yeah. So is that a case of after death communication? Yes, and yes, uh huh, and um, and it's, uh, some of these uh, experiences overlap because it was it was a near death experience. It had all the earmarks of a near death experience, and as you know, in near death experiences, people often do have after death communication with loved ones who have gone before them, and so. Um, so yeah, it was an NDE that included an ADC, a veridical ADC. Yeah. And I was going to change topics here. So um, before before I leave veridical experiences, anything else you want to uh, nail down for us so that we're um, we get where you're coming from? Well, <clears throat> yeah, another aspect of this topic is that uh, several, uh, probably eight different studies have been done where the researcher tried to capture veridical perception under 
controlled conditions in the hospital. I did the first such study in one of my aborted uh, dissertation attempts, by the way, back in the <laughs> mid 1980s. Um, I was working with. Um, I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm part of that club. So we're. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think anybody who's done it, it's rare to. To, for your first idea to, to go through, Let, let's say that as encouragement to people who think, you know, that if they're in this process, that there's something wrong with them, because there isn't. There isn't, um, no. no. But I was working with a chaplain named Lee Joston at um, a, a hospital in Park Ridge, Illinois. And uh, we, um, I had uh, an artist produce uh, these eight inch squares that were actually um, matting for um, for pictures. And there was a red, yellow, blue, orange, green, and purple. And then randomly, the artist would like on a red one, there would be the number eight in each corner and then like a triangle in the middle. And then another red one would have the numbers three, with a circle in the middle. And then a, a blue one would have the number eight with the infinity sign in the middle. So they, they were all mixed up in terms of the color, the number and the symbol, but there were, um, we used eight, uh, six colors, six numbers and six symbols. And um, I um, had janitors install, you know, those um, things that go against the wall that you put a bookshelf on, the arm, yeah. kind of that metal arm thing. And they installed them in the corners of the rooms of the hospital where cardiac arrest was most likely to occur. And when they were all installed, one day after things were quiet, I took my box of these squares, which were in loaded in the box face down, and I would pick up a square and go up a step stool and put the square up there so that I didn't know what, what was, you know, on which one. And um, the idea was that if somebody had a near-death experience, if they went into cardiac arrest, had an NDE, they're up at the ceiling. And most people report that their consciousness is at a ceiling corner. So I had these, you know, in the corners. Then right under their nose, so to speak, you know, they don't right. still have a nose, but would be this thing that hopefully would be in their line of sight, they would see it. And then when they're resuscitated, they would tell us what they saw. And then we could go up. And if they said, you know, it was a red square with the numbers eight and a triangle in the middle, we could go up there and, and verify that that's what what was at that location where they claimed their consciousness was. And then, you know, the chances would be one in six times six times six that they could have just guessed that even if they knew that there was a colored numbered, you know, which they wouldn't even have known. So, um, so all of the subsequent studies have been a variation on this in, in one the researcher used, you know, one of those electronic signs that has a running um, sure, phrase. Yeah. yeah. And um, in Blue another light special on Tuesday. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And she used uh, nonsense phrases like the lollipops are in bloom and, you know, that would hopefully stick with people. Um, and then in another study that I did with Bruce Grayson in the cardiac catheterization lab, where they have to stop the person's heart twice in the process of putting in a pacemaker. Um, and we had a, a computer literally duct taped to the top of a monitor that was up above um, eye level. And before a procedure, Bruce would go in and turn on the, um, the computer and it would take about 30 seconds to boot up, by which time he would be, you know, back on the floor and out of the room. And it would randomly select a, um, an animation and show it uh, for 20 seconds and then say the time is now blah, blah, blah. Because one, another one of the questions is, do 
NDEs actually occur at the time that people perceive them to occur, you know, like while they're in the middle of being brain dead and that sort of thing. Question. Yeah. Yeah. So um, um, the bottom line for all these studies is that none of them so far has succeeded in capturing uh, a case. They um, many of them have uh, yielded more cases of veridical perception that appear in the self does not die, but they just didn't occur under the circum the controlled circumstances. And so um, we, you know, there on the the most skeptical way to interpret that is to say, well, this is all just fiction, and that's why you're not getting anything. But the more informed viewpoint that comes from a lot of advice from near-death experiencers is that, um, well, first of all, we know that, first of all, veridical perception itself is rare. And so the chance of capturing this, even doing a multi-hospital study, you know, like Pim Van Lommel did and, and um, uh, oh, I'm blanking on his name. Michael uh, Tabon? No, uh, he's from England, and he's done the studies most recently. Um, I'll think of his name in a minute. Um, anyway, for um, um, I lost the point that I was getting to. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, in all these cases, uh, oh, so the the least, the, the more informed perception is that um, that veridical perception is rare to begin with. And um, most of the time when people are out of their bodies, they're not looking at things like, you know, a colored square with numbers and symbols on it. They're focused on the physical body and stuff that's going on around the physical body. And um, and so the, the um, circumstances are against us for being able to capture this under controlled circumstances. So, um, so we're still, you know, toying with ideas about how to do, how to do this research and, and be able to um, continue to try to capture it under controlled circumstances, which would be you know, even more evidential than all the cases that we've collected. Yeah. Peter Fennick, by any chance? No, but you're getting closer. He He's worked with Peter. Um, and I'm seeing his face. Uh, he's a actually a, a lung specialist. Um, uh, this is just maddening when I can't think of somebody's name. Um, I'm trying to, go, I'm using the go through the alpha. Oh, P Sam Parnia. Oh, yes. Yeah, of yeah Sam Parnia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, switching subjects. Yeah. Um, tell us about IONS and the work that IONS does and who comes to IONS conferences and, you know, kind of fill us in a little bit because this is a, really influential organization. Yeah, um, it is. Uh, it's it's amazing because most of the people who um, work for IONS are volunteers. And the fact that we do the stuff we do with this huge volunteer network is just sort of awesome to me. Um, but uh, the mission of IONS is to enhance global understanding of near-death experiences and related experiences through research, education, and support. So the research part I've talked a little bit about, we publish the journal and, and which provides a venue for people to be able to publish work on NDEs and related experiences um, that they might not be able to publish in, in other venues. Though at the time that the journal was started, that was a much bigger problem than it is now. Now you find articles on NDEs all, you know, everywhere um, in, uh, in, you know, academic journals. Um, and then, and we also um, support researchers who are doing 
research on NDEs by giving them access to our uh, near-death experience database. Um, so that's a little bit about the research part. And we published The Self Does Not Die, and uh, a new edition of that is coming out uh, next early next year. Um, and so those are some of the research thing. Um, education, we do the conference and we have information on our website and so forth. We do a symposium. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about the conference and symposium. I'll come back to that. And then for support, we um, uh, have uh, local groups. Uh, we now have about 50 across the United States. Uh, we used to have like 75 or something, but the pandemic really, you oh, know, yeah. yeah, made a mess of that. So we're, we're getting back and, um, and people who've had near death experiences or who have personal or professional interest in such experiences or related experiences uh, can come to what usually are monthly meetings and uh, where there might be a featured speaker or um, the people might circle up and talk about their own experiences and things like that. And then um, IANS also has uh, ISCO, IANS um, support groups or sharing groups online, IANS sharing groups online. And, um, and that is an online forum where we have speakers and we have uh, support groups, uh, virtual support groups for people, especially people who don't have a local group near them, they can um, join a virtual group. And, um, um, and so that's, that's like the support. And we have a lot of material on our website too, to support people who um, are going to, you know, talk about this to their physician or mental health professional or, or spiritual, religious professional and, and like, um, suggestions about how to be discerning and who you disclose to and how to disclose in ways that are likely to engender a more helpful rather than harmful response and things like that. So all of that is the support part. So back to the education, um, our two big um, efforts are our annual conference, which we tend to always hold on Labor Day, so that's very end of August, beginning of September, and there we have uh, this. This is a little bit more um, for the general public, um, uh, and we have we do have researchers, um, but we also have um, like healers and um, health professionals and and just experiencers. We have uh, usually one experiencers panel every day of the conference, uh, which is usually a four day conference. And, um, and so uh, up until up through 2019, we were meeting in person, of course, and then the pandemic uh, in 2020 and 2021, our conference was virtual. So like if your listeners wanted to go back and get the uh, presentations from those two virtual conferences, they could do that uh, via ISGO, isgo.ins.org. And, um, uh, and this year, we're again resuming in person, we're actually doing hybrid, it'll, it'll be in person in Salt Lake City. And anybody is invited, anyone who has interest in these subjects. You can be an experiencer, but most of the people are not near-death experiencers. I would say that a lot of the people who attend have had transpersonal experiences of some kind, you know, after-death communication, out-of-body experiences, past life memories, um, precognition, you know, things like that. Um, but not even not everybody has had such experiences, but um, anybody who's interested can, can come. And, um, and people say, like, I had, uh, and at my counseling program at the University of North Texas that I, I was in for over 30 years, a big specialization of theirs is play therapy, which is working with children ages two to 10, eight to 10, um, in 
a particular modality of counseling where the child goes into the playroom, a playroom, and plays for 45 minutes while the counselor um, just is present with them and learns things about the, the child reveals things about themselves. Um, and so um, the year that IANS had our conference in Honolulu, a few of my students came over and were helping with the conference and they were all play therapists and they commented something that I've heard other people, a lot of other people say, but they said it specifically about this, which I thought was really telling that they said, you know, you would think that people who are play therapists, who are dedicated to children's well-being, their mental health and all that, that the conferences would have this feeling of cohesion and inspiration and, and collegiality and things like that, but they don't. They said, here, we have this feeling. It's so unique. Everybody is um, like together and connected and and there's this like spiritual vibe that kind of pervades um, the the conference, and and it's like qualitatively unique. And so, um, I, so that's I, the advantage of coming in person. But I even, love that, and and I will um, second that because I've often thought that well, I mean, people have expressed it to me at conferences that this is their home when they either they've had an experience or they're curious about them or a loved one had an experience this was home for them that they felt free to talk about things and 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 everybody is so willing to share that it does create that sense of community that that you beautifully mentioned so yeah um, double yeah. thumbs up on going to conferences yeah, yeah. And especially you've done such a great job of co-hosting several of our in-person conferences. So you've been great wearing your yeah, kilt. It's it's all about the kilt. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and you also so, run a symposium. What's that about? Right. So the symposium uh happens in the spring, sometimes the very early spring. And um uh and it is a more focused, it's a one-day. Uh, usually one day, the last one we did actually was two two days or three days, but usually it's a one day focused uh, online event uh, focused on a particular topic. So our first one was about disclosing near-death experiences in healthcare um, environments, and it was for healthcare professionals to help them not harm, but actually help people who they, you know, their clients and patients who've had NDEs and related experiences. The second one last year, uh, 2021 was, or I'm sorry, 2022 was on uh, this, uh, the question of uh, the relationship between mind and brain, this question of materialism versus idealism that we um, touched on earlier. And the one coming up for 2023 is going to be on um, the role of near-death experiences and related experiences in grief and grief counseling. So it will be for people who are grieving, who are um, counselors, who work with clients who are grieving, which is like, who, who doesn't? Um, and, and actually any healthcare professional, uh, whether mental health, physical health, like doctors and nurses, or spiritual religious health, um, healthcare professionals like um, chaplains and clergy, and, um, and the role that these experiences play in, um, in helping people with grief. So we'll be talking about NDEs and grief, after-death communication and grief, um, and out-of-body experiences and grief. Um, and maybe some maybe some other things like past life memories and and that sort of thing. Um, hearing from people uh, who have actually experienced the role that the experience played in their grief process, but then also looking at research, you know, kind of the bigger picture of what we know about 
um, the effect on grief. So um, yeah, so that's going to be the 2023. Boy, that sounds like fun. Oh, can't wait. This is yeah. great. Um, and people can get information about the conference and the symposiums at the website. Yep. Ians.org. I-A-N-D-S dot org. <laughs> and it's a great website. It's huge. I mean, there's just all kinds of things in there. So yeah, once you start poking around, it's like a rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It is. And we're wrapping this up, Jan. So any um, last little commercial that you want to give about something? Anything? Hmm. I can't think of anything. I, I've mentioned, we've talked about the conference, the symposium, the upcoming uh, revised issue of The Self Does Not Die, um, the Journal of Near-Death Studies. Maybe I will say that anybody who's interested, uh, the Journal of Near-Death Studies, all of our articles from the past 30 plus years are available the full article is available online for free. So if you go to the IONS website, go to the research tab, uh, go down to Journal of Near-Death Studies, and then to Past Issues, when you click on that, you'll see the issues by volume number. And you just click on a volume, it opens up all of the um, articles that were published in that uh, volume and at the end of each citation is a DOI, a digital object identifier, which is like an ID um, for an article. And you click on it and it brings up the article in full. So um, 30 plus years of research available um, for free online. I love it. And, yeah. And IANS has a newsletter. Yes. That's right. Our, it's actually evolved into a magazine called Vital Signs. It's published uh, quarterly. So, uh, and, and it includes like, there'll usually be an NDE um, and, and just all kinds of information about things that are happening in IANS. And um, we also, uh, uh, another, that's a perk. You get it for free if you're a, um, an IANS member. And another perk, which is one of my favorites, is the monthly NDE. Yes. And that's where you know that you're just tooling through your email and suddenly appears the monthly NDE. And I don't know about you, but after all these years of all the research I've done, all the NDE years I've heard and talked to and studied and everything, when I see that, I almost always drop everything and read it because it's another, it's an account that one of our um, volunteers, Anne, uh, takes from our archives that has some particular interest. And it's the, it's the actual account right there. And so I read another account of an NDE and, and I'm inspired all over again. All over That's again. every month. Well, Jan, you have inspired us. So oh. thank you for taking the time to be with us today here at the Afterlife Files. And gosh, um, best wishes as you lead the organization IANS into its future. And personally, of course, have, yes. have a wonderful um, semi-retirement. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Thank you so much, Scott, for having me. It's just been, like you said, a ton of fun. Wasn't that wonderful? There's a couple of concepts that could be expanded upon. Just to be clear, these are my viewpoints, but that's why you watch the Afterlife Files to gain perspective by using more than one lens with which to view this rich information. First, it feels like we should take a stand on materialism versus idealism. All the research I've done, the interviews I've conducted, the research I've read, all point to the model of consciousness best explained by idealism. It's my vote for it being our current best answer. Thank you, Jan Holden. 
for giving us an introduction to reflective judgment theory. I appreciate that. You can check out this model for yourself by reading the many research-oriented books on NDEs and by searching the database of stories at IANDS.org, that's I-A-N-D-S, or Enderf.org, N-D-E-R-F. Second, I found her discussion of veridical experiences. Remember, those are the things that can be observed during an NDE or an SDE to be really helpful. I appreciate why research would be frustrated with their controlled experiments failing. And I can think of a lot better things to do during my NDE rather than recognize and remember some colored cards in the upper corner of the hospital room that just wouldn't rank as important considering what else is going on. Third, Jan opened this interview with an amazing story about Pam Reynolds. I did a quick search of YouTube and there are plenty of good videos describing her amazing experience. Check them out. Fourth, I did my doctoral research on how people change their leadership style based on what NDEers found out when they left the world of duality and entered into the universe of unity. I thought she did a nice job explaining how people make decisions moment to moment all the way to global decisions. It requires that experiencers check in with the truth of their perceptions and how that squares with the purpose of the universe that Jan reports, to love and to advance our capacity to love. I do hope that videos such as this can give you some insight on what near-death and shared-death experiencers discover about the afterlife, the nature of consciousness, and how to live your life more fully. I have six albums that you can use to start your exploration of the transmaterial universe on your own. And if you're ready to jump all in, the best way to experience the other side is to participate in our five-and-a-half-day retreat. There are links below that will take you to the information on the different elements of our NDE courses and the skill set that you'll learn. Our courses use binaural beat and gamma synchrony technology so that you can attain and sustain expanded states of consciousness easily and safely. That means our courses are perfect for both adept meditators and newbies. Everyone will benefit. Okay, so how will you make decisions based on what you've heard today? I trust you will make an effort to run down the three steps of reflective judgment theory process to get to the current best answer. If you're watching on YouTube, like, subscribe, and comment. You can find the Afterlife Files on all podcast streaming apps, Apple, Google, Spotify, Audible, the lot. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, or pay us a visit at neardeathmeditations.com. That's neardeathmeditations.com. Bye now, see you next time, and thank you for joining us here at the Afterlife Files.